we're in the, the most deeply, overwhelmingly industrial spot on Earth that has decided not to look industrial at all. <laughs> but it's also, I, I think, a kind of poetics, a visual poetics. And so Bleeding Through is just one of many objects talking about. Ooh, I'm getting a very strange feeling walking through this. It feels so much like Brooklyn when I was a boy. Is that my button or your button? What? Oh my God. Look, I'm, I'm deconstructing. So even though it looks fake, it's actually really fake. It's a real fake. It's a real fake and then a kind of fake, fakeish fake, a semi-fake fake, right? And there's so many, we need new words. Every city starts with a single structure. At one point, somebody said, this is a good place to stay. So, fences were built. The fences turned into walls and walls into railroads. Not all stops along this way vanished completely. Disguised in layers, they lie underneath the clock of time. Every movie starts with a single idea. At one point somebody said, someone should make a movie about this. So he wrote a script, or more precisely, the first page of a script. Over the course of several months, it became increasingly surrounded by notes. For this is the way you release your creativity, one mad scribbling at a time. This particular movie didn't start with an idea, but with the opportunity to attend a workshop called Media, Memory and the City. We listened to lectures about how media and memory are interconnected with the perception of cities and their individual histories. As a special guest, Norman M. Klein, urban and media historian and professor at the California Institute of Arts, attended the evening. Um, I first came across Norman's work in the early 2000s when I began to be interested in cities and questions of urban memory and layering. I then wrote an essay on Bleeding Through um, over 10 years ago and was in contact with Norman about a conference that I meant to invite him to, but that somehow didn't work for reasons of time then. And then earlier this year in June, Norman very kindly wrote to me saying he was in Germany and could we maybe meet? Uh, so we fairly spontaneously sat together in a cafe in Karlsruhe for about half a day. Yeah, it seemed like, like three days, actually. Was it, was it that long and boring? No, no, no. no. <laughs> his lecture was about his research and the different aspects of contemporary history that concerned his work. Certainly in the United States, I think many places. In place of honest, collectively bargained contracts, we find modes of indenture. Like, like uh, every taxi cab driver and Lyft driver you meet, right? <laughs> you one example. But there are others as well, of course, everywhere. They perversely resemble quit rent, serfdom in the 15th century, or a hundred variations of sharecropping since the late Roman Empire. In an exhibition, we could experience Mr. Klein's more interactive works, especially his multimedia novel, Bleeding Through. Suddenly it dawned upon us. We had no idea. So, we asked an expert. My name is Jens Skor. I'm Professor of British and Anglophone Literature and Culture at the University of Duisburg-Hessen and part of my research is in urban studies, literary urban studies, representations of cities, that sort of thing. What we did in the KBE, an Institute for Advanced Study in the Humanities in Essen, where Norman was here in December, um, was to take some of his key concerns in his work in the last few decades, namely questions of the connection between media, uh, memory and the city, to take that connection uh, as the foundation for a workshop that we built around his work. So, so although most of the essay and most of the, uh, the um, presentations didn't centrally engage with Norman Klein's work, uh, they were on about the same sort of topic, the same connection between media memory and the city. 
Leading through is a 2003 documentary by Norman Klein. Uh, it's a combination of a 40-page print text, uh, a fictitious text on a character named Molly who lives in 20th century Los Angeles. And that print text is accompanied by a multimedia DVD, uh, several thousand images, film clips, newspaper clippings, mind maps, partly reshot scenes from classic Hollywood films. Uh, and together, Bleeding Through explores layers of 20th century Los Angeles, uh, questions of urban development, questions of racism, questions of real estate speculation, uh, how popular culture goes hand in hand, uh, mystifying these issues. So in a sense, it's a radically subversive, uh, bottom-up uh, perspective on 20th century urban development. Uh, you could call it a, a hypertext, multimedia, documentary, database narrative. What I find interesting is that in 2003, and this is um, in, the, in the early days of, of hypertext, if you like, um, it's not based on, on a website, it's not mounted on a website, uh, but what it did in 2003 is make very advanced use of what was then uh, the latest um, technology. So it's a, a radically non-linear text that explores in random sequence of uh, with material brought up from an archive on the DVD, uh, explores 20th century Los Angeles. So if you think, for instance, about uh, a line, a sequence of images, if you start with one image and click three to the right and then three to the left, you don't even end up with the same image. Uh, and to some extent, this random sequence is part of the point. Uh, Norman would probably say that we shouldn't overestimate the sort of um, clicking and clacking, as he calls it. Um, but I, I do find that some of this randomness is part of the point, that this non-linear presentation of the material uh, is, is part of the point. So imagine the same kind of material, the same kind of message um, brought to you in a 90-minute documentary film that you just sit through. Uh, so the, the fact that as a, as a user you explore the material, that nothing happens without you clicking some kind of button, toggling some kind of bar, doing something, that nothing happens without the, the reader or user or viewer, as it's sometimes been called, doing something, is part of the point. It's sort of a user activation uh, in generating this bottom-up perspective that I find important. I think what you get is, is a view of what Norman calls uh, anti-LA. He, he says what he does in LA with visitors is do an anti-tour, show them what you don't normally see, show them what gets uh, eliminated from the public perception of, uh, of Los Angeles. So what it does is it gives you a view of things that you generally don't see, it gives you a level of historical depth that you normally don't get. Uh, especially because LA has been marked by a radical erasure of entire neighborhoods in the 20th century. So part of what you see will be uh, footage, film clips, images, uh, videos uh, of neighborhoods that aren't even physically there anymore. Uh, and that's something that, that just gets lost with, with regular tours of Los Angeles, for instance. Armed with more knowledge, thanks to Mr. Gore's revealing exposition about Bleeding Through and Mr. Klein's work in general, we were eager to meet this fabled giant in the field of cultural studies and the humanities. We invited Mr. Klein and Mr. Gore to visit the Christmas Market, an annual attraction in Essen. In hindsight, not the best idea, since it gives the footage a distinguished Christmas touch. As a media expert, he also gave us some advice how to handle the footage we were shooting. So we'll see. Maybe some of that you can keep. Let's see. I mean, that's how I do it. And then I, I talk in, you know, we'll see. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, right? But I tried to see something that would, would work with the other visuals. And then uh, you can fill in and show bleeding through and show how it works. And then it gives the viewer something to work from, and then it's probably what you've shot anyway. As we were walking through the illuminated city, Mr. Klein told us about bleeding through, the structure of Western cities and their different layers, and much more. I'm, I'm, like one time I, 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 I met a person who was the police advisor for a crime show, and, the, and uh, he said, you know, I've had to make some adjustments because in real life, it is the person you think it is. 
the movie always begins, oh, it can't be the wife. It is always the wife. <laughs> Who do you think kills the husband? The one who's the most pissed off is, of course, it's the wife. It's, so I had to think of some way to not make it real. You know what, to make it real enough so that they could have a half an hour, an hour show. And everyone laughed. And I've had so many versions of that. Uh, what, the movie uh, Chinatown, Robert. I just saw it. Yeah, I, 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 we interviewed Robert Town, and he was giving a lecture. He said, "Oh, I have to say, I, I, I grew up in, in San Pedro, all the way down in the harbor near L.A. And when I made the film, I really, when I wrote the script, I didn't make the film, wrote the script. I wasn't really thinking of the truth. I was thinking of my childhood and the smell of the trees." The eucalyptus trees have a funny smell. Oh, no, it went on and on how about fake it was. And then the questions and answers all started with the same question first statement. They said, now that we know that Chinatown is the most real way to look at Los Angeles history, so the commodity of our eyes and our vision is part of what Bleeding Through is also about. This woman who happened to live near where all the crime films were shot, but hated them, only watched comedies, and, and may have murdered her second husband, but no one can tell. And, and it goes on and on, and yet all these visuals together create this, this, this kind of staggered aperture where you think that you're inside the movie, right? And meanwhile, we don't really know. So it's, a, it's, it, it's an attempt to use archive data and layers to talk about what's happened to our eyes, you might say. So we have all these layers of meaning, and, and bleeding through is about different layers, isn't it? And each layer, of, of the meaning has uh, another statement that seems like it should be more realistic. And yet the more real it gets, the more unreal it gets. By the, by the third tier, you finally know more than the movie could hold. So we're very obsessed with how the eye has played tricks with us, but also how we, it's a commodity now, these tricks. And the film, uh, the film version of anything now is becoming more and more like that. And then the theory we had was that uh, the past is in black and white and the present is in color. That's just the weirdness of how we think. Bleeding through, in a way, is a reflection of how, how the apparatus of the city has memories already similar to what cinema does. I guess that's, that's sort of true in a way. Um, and uh, If we expanded bleeding through uh, to, to something larger, I guess we could get into the layers of, of the city especially cities that have this fierce global memory, like Jerusalem, Rome, and Los Angeles. Are, 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 I would say Rome, Jerusalem, and Los Angeles are three of the most misremembered cities on Earth. And uh, I, I guess uh, uh, Berlin is another one, because there's so many movies, right? And Los Angeles uh, is a very strange place. Um, the three square miles of bleeding through was relatively intact. It was, it was close to um, how, how the city was as of 1887, let's say. But from the eight, late 1890s, almost, almost every city in the West got very, very physically big. It, like Manhattan got bigger, uh, Paris got bigger, Berlin got bigger, um, Mexico City got bigger, and Los Angeles got bigger. But it got bigger in a strange way because instead of it having cities around it, it had tiny, weird little towns. Really weird little towns. So they absorbed 35 little towns and 30 more that were so small, they didn't even have a way to become a town. So, so actually what, what Bleeding Through captures is one of the few intact, historically sensible parts of Los Angeles because you have a, you have a beginning and a middle, almost, almost like Essen, right? During our talk with the two professors, we realized that Mr. Klein's desire to create a narrative continuation of Bleeding Through would not be possible to implement. Bleeding Through's main angle is to look at Los Angeles and its layered structure. Mr. Klein, who can be understood to be a molded flaneur in the sense of Walter Benjamin, had taken in his hometown Brooklyn from an early age on. His narrations about Los Angeles were accented by a wild potpourri of historic facts, socio-cultural theories and especially of anecdotal gems that he probably also collected during his many expeditions throughout the city. Although it was not difficult for us to understand the narrative structure of Bleeding Through, 
Our ignorance of Los Angeles became apparent to us in this moment. Indeed, our ignorance of the USA, even though we always had the feeling we knew it, just like probably all people in their mid-twenties who grew up in a Western developed country from watching movies and TV. A medial construct existing independently of real geographic borders. A layer made up of thousands of ads, action movies, political speeches and social media postings which had buried the actual USA beneath it. This illusory world finds its climax in LA, setting of film classics of the 20th century. But this reality does not exist. It is nothing but one of many layers that define the city as it is. Right? Um, there, there are so many books about, um, uh, like, like Franco Moretti's book, where he goes over the, the realism of uh, uh, Balzac and finds that Balzac was so realistic, but the city he described doesn't match the map of the real city. So, so we, we, we have this artificial city, imaginary cities, social imaginaries of cities, and they are worth money. Mr. Klein was our travel guide through the alleys of this fictitious metropole. There's some scholars call it the cinematic city. Yeah. Um, but, but uh, I mean, I'll give you a, a simple example. I'll, I'll go from, from New York to Los Angeles to Germany in two minutes. So buckle up and I'll, I'll do it this way, right? Um, in the 1920s, when they began to set up a kind of Ford industrial model of studios, they built these sets, and the sets looked like New York because they came from New York. And then uh, in the 20s, it didn't matter so much. Um, but in the 30s, they really needed to stay close to these because the sound was too complicated out in the streets. The noises and the equipment was heavy and clumsy. So they shot over and over and over and over again until finally people began to really believe that was there. And, and they blended New York with other cities. Then they would shoot out in the real streets, like in the 40s, like for Noir. And then they would mix them together. So they have the fake street and the real street mixed together. And they learned how to do that. And then the French loved these films because of their realism. They found it very authentic and beautiful. So they would put filters even on the cameras to see if they could capture the LA light because Paris didn't look right. So now Paris didn't look right. <laughs> so, so now we have, um, by the time you get to the, the, a film like Breathless and the ones that came afterward, you have a French version of an American version of an LA version of New York. <laughs> so, so even though it looks fake, it's actually really fake. It's a real fake. There's a real fake and then a kind of fake, fakeish fake, a semi-fake fake, right? There's so many, we need new words. When there are that many versions of a city, where does the real city end and does the fictional one begin? There are even different fictional counterparts to a city. There are many LA's, many movie cities. An LA of the film Noir, one of the dark science fiction and one of 80's action heroes that let the city light up in neon light. These all superimpose the real LA which is already fragmented in itself, and get mixed with the viewer's expectations. You, you have that in your mind. You have that movie city. And uh, I, 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 know, I, I know it. I remember when I came to LA, it took me two years. I was so disappointed. I couldn't find the goddamn thing. I couldn't find the city. I thought I saw the city. I couldn't find it. I kept looking around. It took me two years to get... I was so pissed off. Our trip through the movie city ended at the ocean shore of Insight. Mr. Klein's guidance through the different layers of his work made us also question our own perceptions. And to see, there is more than the physical city. It is covered by ideas, stagings and a general cultural image. Our hometown Essen cannot free itself from this either. Former mining metropolis, grey, dirty, and yet, European green capital. What seemed so difficult at the beginning of this project was to bring all these different aspects together that Mr. Klein combines in his work and that I applied in Bleeding Through. 
However, Mr. Klein made us realize that what was outside of the field of vision was what really counts. The social imaginary is a very powerful phenomenon, but film really accelerates it, I think. But uh, it is true that maybe it isn't just about movies. I think that makes a lot of sense, because the, our mental pictures are so much more powerful than what movies can make. So maybe it's not the city in the movies, it's the city we imagine next to the movies. It's the street that we think we're walking through that's outside the screen. An extra diegetic space, they call it. On the edge of the frame, and there you are, that kind of thing.